Hi, my name is Gabrielle Tardy, and I'm a Clinical Anatomy Research Fellow here at the Seattle Science Foundation, and I'm going to be talking on a circular confluence of sinuses. So another older term used for the confluence of sinuses is the torcular herophili. It describes veins as a gutter or canal. And it also, the term torcular herophili also honors Herophilus, who was an ancient Greek anatomist who's claimed the father of anatomy because he was the first to pre perform systematic dissections on the human body. The confluence of sinuses, it's located deep to the occipital protuberance of the skull, and there's a concavity in the bone where the confluence of sinuses sit. It's a very important junction of the dural venous sinuses because, and I'll show you, it connects various dural venous sinuses for drainage. And so here we can see the superior sagittal sinus, the straight sinus, the occipital sinus and the two transverse sinuses and all intersecting at one point is the confluence of sinuses. So over here you can see a posterior view of the confluence of sinuses and um, other views here as well. Now flow goes towards the confluence of sinuses through three sinuses, the superior sagittal sinus, the occipital sinus and the straight sinus go towards the confluence of sinuses whereas flow moves away from the confluence of sinuses via the transverse sinuses, which we can see on both sides. Now, this variation, this confluence of sinuses is actually highly variable. So there was a case report where we had an eight-year-old female who had a previous history of chronic headaches and questionable papyedema on physical exam. Her head circumference was 50% of age, um, 50% for age, and she had slight developmental delay. So they were suspicious of maybe this could be pseudotumor cerebri. So they carried, they did some brain imaging to see that, to check to see if it was that, and they did an MRI and an MRV. The MRI showed no intracranial pathology, no hydrocephalus, but the MRV showed a circular formation of the confluence of sinuses, which no one has really ever seen before, as well as a known variation which, is, was, which was an absent right-sided transverse sinus. So here we have um, a picture of the MRV where you see the superior sagittal sinus coming down here, but then you see it draining into this roundabout or circular tube-like confluence of sinuses. Over here, we can see the straight sinus coming into this roundabout, and below, we have the occipital sinus sorry, the occipital sinus, and then you see one transverse sinus on the left side, but no transverse sinus on the right side, so she was missing her right transverse sinus. Here's another picture that just shows um, the straight sinus better on this view of the image. Now, I'm going to talk about the embryology to try and understand how these variations can occur. So the initial organization for the drainage of capillaries actually in the head of a human embryo begins with a main head vein. And this main head vein starts off in the midbrain, in the region of the midbrain, and it travels caudally alongside the neural tube. Now, the main head vein, it drains blood from this network of capillaries, um, which serves as actually the origin of this venous drainage from the neural tube. From this capillary of network, network of capillaries, there are anastomosing venous loops that are stemming from it, and they drain into three plexuses, which is the anterior plexus, the, post, the middle plexus, and the posterior plexus, which we can see here, anterior, middle, and posterior plexus. The anterior plexus, as forebrain growth progresses, the anterior plexus, it shifts caudally, but a part of the anterior plexus actually remains where the forebrain is, and that becomes the sagittal plexus. And from the sagittal plexus, we get the formation of the superior sagittal sinus. And you can see how the sagittal sinus over here is forming, and it's coming a bit forward, and you can see it, it form. Now, the straight sinus is actually a branch of the anterior plexus that moved caudally. And then we have the anterior plexus and the middle plexus as the embryo continues to develop, it joins together 
moving, draining caudally, and it actually becomes less evolved than its prior form. And this is where it creates the junction where the, straight, where the superior sagittal sinus, the straight sinus, the transverse sinuses, the occipital sinus, intersect at one point, which marks the birth of the confluence of sinuses. So we can see, I'll leave the picture, it's a progression, very nice schematic of forebrain growth and development of these tural venous sinuses. And this is from Streeter. So, as I said, the confluence of sinuses is highly variable. And in the literature, there are nine different types. Now, these are quite a mouthful to talk about all nine types, but I'll just let you know that they vary on where the different sinuses intersect, they drain direct, or where they drain directly into, um, you know, which sinuses are connected to which, as well as if there's a nastomotic vein connecting the sinuses, or whether a sinus is absent or defective, like our patient. So type one is the most common, most commonly observed, but interestingly enough, it may not be the type existing in the majority of the population, but it does correlate with the historical definition of the confluence of sinuses where all the sinuses, they intersect at the confluence of sinuses at one point, and I have the percentages, um, which 32.7% have this type. Type two, the difference, as you can see in the schematics here, there's two, two types, A and B, but it just depends on where the superior sagittal sinus connects, if it's on the right transverse sinus or the left. Type three, we see you know, this, this straight sinus connecting to both transverse sinuses. Type four, um, so again, depends on where the straight sinus connects, whether it's to the right transverse sinus or the left. And we can see in the schematic, as well as the rates of patients that have it. Type five, again, two types. Um, where you know the straight sinus connects to the occipital sinus or the straight sinus connects with the occipital sinus and other veins like this small anastomotic vein we can see in 5b. Type 6 is whether you have a defective left transverse sinus A or B defective right transverse sinus. We can see it in the schematic. Type 7, the, straight, the, the superior sagittal sinus trains into the straight sinus and the left transverse sinus and the straight sinus branches into bilateral transverse sinuses. So again, the differences are quite a mouthful. Um, and type eight, there's another straight sinus draining into the superior sagittal sinus and the left straight sinus and so on, as you can see. And the last type in the literature is type nine, which is quite a mouthful as well, but there's an anastomotic vein connecting the superior sagittal sinus and the straight sinus. And you can see the various ural sinuses training into each other. So another important um, thing to talk about is whether what type of communication there is between the right transverse sinus and the left transverse sinus. And there are four simple types. Type A, a wide communication, which majority of the population have. Type B is a narrow communication. Type C is no communication. And type D is a single transverse sinus, like our patient had. So as I said, there are many variations depending on where the sinuses drain into, where they connect. And, men, and many have um, spoken about the percentages that occur in patients in the literature. So what is the clinical relevance of whether there are variations to the confluence of sinuses? Well, depending on if you have one, verse, one transverse sinus versus two transverse sinuses, or depending on when you have, whether you have a wide communication or an hour communication, it will determine somewhat the risk and degree of cerebral edema. Because when you have, you don't have proper flow, because this is drainage system, drainage venous system in the brain, if you don't have drainage properly, the blood is gonna back up and it's gonna cause cerebral edema, sinus venous congestion. And as we know, the brain is quite enclosed in our brain and we, the brain is quite enclosed in our skull and we don't have much room for any expansion, so this is quite important. In addition, if there's any obstruction to a transverse sinus or one of the dural venous sinuses during surgery, and let's say we're missing the other transverse sinus, that's gonna cause problems. So if we look at it, two transverse sinuses with a wide communication gives the smallest risk of cerebral edema. Now, when we look at our patient, 
who had a rare circular variant, um, we think, okay, this can definitely cause an increased risk of venous sinus congestion. Not only does she have a circular variant where there's decreased surface area of the veins draining into this confluence, but also she's missing her right transverse sinus. And they could have increased resistance to flow as well because of the shape of the confluence. And this is very important to detect before doing any sort of surgery on anyone. And this might be the reason why our patient had a raised intracranial pressure papyodema on physical exam. And this is her images again. So as we know, the confluence of sinuses, it is a very well-encountered structure in brain surgery and interventional procedures and where the venous root is, is used. So it is of utmost importance that we recognize each dural sinus pre and intraoperatively um, to make sure that they are if there are any anomalies and to prevent any iatrogenic injury to these dural sinuses and be able to detect if this patient may be an increased risk for cerebral edema. And as we've never seen this type of confluence of sinuses, which is circular in shape, maybe this could be classified as type 10 in the literature. Thank you. Very good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions?